that he put the gun back to my forehead, he went click, and he chuckled. Uh, so he's a very sick man. If you get a chance to talk to this guy, though, though I think it's going to be events in his life that drove what, what uh, you know, it's a lot of anger in 29 days to kill six people. There's always certainly been the thought that some kind of life distress or some kind of traumatic, you know, psychological event that led to, the, to, to unleashing all that in such a short period of time. last murder in Raytown. Uh, it's my understanding that that information about the cases being link, linked by ballistics was released to the media at the time. And after that information was released to the media, that weapon was never used again in another murder. They could have simply said the mode of operation was similar. Instead, they told the bad guy, we know it's the same gun. So of course he's going to switch guns because he doesn't want to continue using the same gun that they already know he's used, right? So suddenly we have three cases, not too long after, you know, a year or so in Texas, they're very similar. died Tuesday night from gunshot wounds to the neck, head and face. She was at work at the dancer's closet in Arlington when someone robbed the store. In her condition, Amy called 911 for help. Her stop. Okay, do you need an ambulance? Okay, where are you hurt? It's a terrible thing to listen to. I mean, it really is. This, this is a, a young woman uh, who's, who's dying. And she knows she's dying, and, and she, how she had to wherewithal to to, uh, to call the police, I, I don't know. People, people will surprise you with what they can do. Uh, whenever, whenever I was told that by the boss, I'd go get that tape. And, and with each boss, I only had to do it one time. I'd play the tape for him, and uh, after hearing it, he'd say, uh, you know what, you go ahead and stay on that case. Because nobody can listen, it, well, if there's somebody who can listen to that tape and not be moved by it, uh, they need to find another line of work. I kept my eyes closed and knew this horrible individual wanted me dead. Why? I don't know, but this person wanted me dead. Um, that was his only reason for being in there. He was very pensive. He was, he was looking at the two windows. There was two side windows. The front was windowed. He was very much looking out. Um, those never really got close, um, you know, to me before uh, um, before he shot me. Um, 
He was acting very nervous, but I was overriding that. I was leaving, I was closing up for four o'clock that day, going, uh, going on vacation. So my mind was certainly not there. He had said something about a frame that he wanted. He pointed at the frame, I'd had it in my hand, was walking back. Uh, I never heard him come up on me, never heard a thing, heard a very loud pop behind me, um, and then was looking at the side of an amwa and I realized I was falling very slowly down the side of the amwa. My breathing was so shallow, you wouldn't have detected it anyway. Um, I believe that when he rolled me over, that actually um, helped me. Um, my breathing got a tiny bit better. It was a little easier for me to breathe. Um, but he came up over me and he put the gun back to my forehead. He went click and he chuckled. Uh, so he's a very sick man. In 2001, uh, at 7th and 70 Liquors in Terre Haute, there was a homicide that uh, a store clerk was robbed there and then shot. handgun from his waistband on the right side. Asked Billy for the money. Billy then brought out the, the cash register drawer, set it on the counter. That time, suspect reached, grabbed the money out of the cash register drawer. Notice that the robber didn't try to hide his face. What happens next is shocking. I was the first responding officer in 2001 on this case. You walk in on something like that, it sticks with you, obviously. You remember these things, you know, probably into retirement. It's at least worth looking just to make sure he's not still out doing something. But like anything else, you know, profiling has evolved tremendously since then. We don't have an updated profile uh, at this point. One of the other things that, that was discussed was that, you know, if he was involved in, he may have been involved in previous robberies. And that's why he wasn't uh, leaving witnesses. Anytime you have a uh, personal gain or enterprise uh, coming into the picture, robbery, uh, theft, uh, you know, taking of money, that, that takes away from that diabolical basis of uh, the contrived, uh, premeditated, uh, predator-type serial killer, which usually has a sexual aspect to it. It's, it's not a, a typical serial killer. It's our belief that robbery was secondary to what was going on with, this crime, with these crimes. I mean, it's no secret that these are not uh, typical robbery targets. They're not typical robbery places and times. If you're going to go rob some place, I'm not picking a ceramic store to go rob. I'm not picking a small shoe store to go rob. Your average stick-up man, this is not what he's going to do. This guy obviously did more than one killing, and all of those killings were at odd times. And when you consider the times of day, there are times when people are out and about. Back in the 90s, gas stations. I mean, credit cards wasn't as prevalent, so I would have been hidden anywhere but probably the places he was choosing to rob. You know, it, it probably really got uh, the juices flowing for him, yeah. knowing that people were basically right next door or maybe on the street in front of the place. One of the things, and this has been released previously, was that they believe that probably the first crime, he may have been familiar with that area or even live in that area. So at the time, and you know, we can't discount this, at the time they believe that maybe he was from the Indianapolis area, 
or at least had business or was comfortable being in the Indianapolis area and that's why uh, that's where the first crime occurred. With that being said, I mean, it wasn't by accident that he showed up in Wichita. The fact that Indianapolis was the first and, and Wichita was the second, he had traveled with a purpose and whether that is a, whether, whether that is, you know, a, a over the road, over the road driver or um, sales delivery or, or something, but, but that's a long distance to, to cover in a very short time. If you're a killer and you're just looking for, looking for something, somebody to, some opportune place, there's plenty of places between here and there uh, that, that you, you didn't have to come this far. I mean, there had to be a, a reason for him uh, traveling or, you know, now that reason could be uh, something as simple as just visiting relatives or something, or you had to have a purpose to go to these different places. In, in my mind, just can't see him uh, just driving to these particular locations and businesses just for the purpose of what he was doing. Something I notice the most is families get left behind. Nothing will bring him back. That's all you really want. You want him to never be gone. And there's never going to be any closure for me. There's never going to be any closure for her, for her brother or her brother or sister-in-law or any of our any of my family that anybody that was close to her. We've always said that the the memory of that day stays with us. You know, it's fresh every day, so to speak. And we think about Nancy a lot. We think about her every day. There's no closure. Because uh, we think about this all the time. I think about this daily. In the day of my life, that this uh, hasn't haunted me and will till the day I die. People ask me, well, how do you deal with this? Well, excuse me, how many options do I have? Can I say, oh, hey, you know, that was a mistake. She, yeah, you just bring her back. You can't do that. She's gone. All we have is memories.